In our last presentations, we've been looking at how networking works with the internet and also with mobile phones. We took a look at the history of mobile phones from the zero generation all the way up to the current fourth generation. And we've looked at common architectures of internet communications like TCP IP and UDP and things like that. In this lecture, we're going to see how we can apply those networking principles to our mobile application and how we can use networking to go out and get data that's useful to us that we can integrate. So first of all, how do we get data? Well, uh, going back to about 2000, there was kind of a, a standard way to fetch data. Uh, even before that, there were interoperability programs. So, uh, you, you know, if we go all the way back to, you, know, you can go back as far as you want, but if you think back to uh, the mainframe days, many times we had a central mainframe with some uh, dummy terminals that would interact with that mainframe. Then as we got into the PC era, this is hard to believe today, but a lot of times PCs were not on a network. And the only way to transfer data from one PC to another was a floppy disk. So, uh, or many times back then it was printed out and then go type it back in again somewhere else. So a very inefficient process. Then as we got into the 90s, we had things like CORBA, the Common Request Broker Architecture, and uh, COM and DCOM, the Component Object Model, which were Microsoft's versions of those for Microsoft Technologies, and Java RMI, which was a way we could speak from one Java process to another. All of these still are useful today, but there's kind of a move around 2000 to have a common framework, because the problem with a lot of these older frameworks is that they were complex, they required a lot of heavy programming. It wasn't an easy way to interoperate among different software. So along came uh, these, these things like REST and SOAP and WSDL. And uh, initially, what was the most common was to have an XML-based communication model. So if I look, we can go to xmethods.net. And this is a list of freely available web services. Or not freely available, some of them do cost, some of them are free. But these are places where you can get data off of the internet. And you can leverage that data in your application. Uh, so think very seriously about this because this is a place where you can go to uh, find data and integrate data. And we said that there's a lot of value in data integration. Uh, turning data into information or data integration is something that will give us a lot of value. So these web service listings will give us a lot of value. The only trick is, if you look at XML-based web services, it's rather bloated. There's a lot of stuff here, which it can lead to a large size file, which if you're dealing with a limited network capacity, it might be a consideration. Maybe you might want to find an alternative that has uh, not as much data. So on the other extreme, we will have something like uh, this, where we have just data without any tags or any labels. That's good only if you know what the data is, uh, but not so good if you don't know what the data is. So a nice compromise that comes in between is JSON, which is what we're looking at here. And this is going to be something that we're going to use in our application that I'm demonstrating to you. So you see what we have is an open curly, and then the word plants, and then a colon, and then a square bracket. Each of these means something. Open curly means we have an object. The square bracket means we have a series of data which are similar, okay, a series of objects. Uh, we'll look more into that when we actually do some JSON parsing. But this is what we're going to want to integrate with the app that we're building with our lectures. Right now I'm searching on common as maple. If I change it to pawpaw, whoops, and I put in an extra uh, letter there. So if I change like so, okay, we'll see we get one result. If I change it to redbud, we'll see we'll get many different results, but all of them redbuds. If we change it to oak, uh, we'll see that we get several results, many results. So uh, this, is, this is what we're doing with JSON, is we're getting back some data that, that we want to use within our application. But first, how do we connect to a website like the one that I just showed you, where we can get back JSON data like this? 
Well, what we can do is we can use the HTTP GET method that we talked about in a previous lecture. And the good news is, it's fairly easy to do that. We have to know a little bit about uh, some, something called an Apache HTTP project, but that makes it very easy to send in a URL, in other words, something like this, complete with the name Oak, and then get back data. Okay, so we're submitting URL, we're getting back data. Okay, so the URL we're going to pass to an object called an HTTP get object. And then what we're going to do is we're going to associate that with a response handler, which is going to know how to handle the data that it gets back. Okay, and then an HTTP client is going to marry those two together. Okay, and then we'll run this method, we'll get back our data. So that's what we're about to do. A lot of this is boilerplate. Okay, this can be reused many times. Notice we have string coming in, and I didn't show it here, but we have, let's, let me add that string response equals, and we have string coming out. So string URL going in, string coming out. It doesn't care what actually that string represents, we just have string in, string out, and that's what we want to do. Okay, so let's remember what our program currently looks like. If we take a look, we know that we're currently wired up to something called plant DAO stub. And we're wired up to that when we get to the um, plant results activity. And the plant DAO stub, as we see right here, has a method called fetch plants. Okay, the plant DAO stub has a method called fetch plants. And we're passing into that a search parameter which is something that we want to search on. Okay, well, this stub is just a dummy implementation. Okay, this stub is a dummy implementation where we have some hard-coded results because at the time that we made this class, we didn't know how to do networking, and that's fine. So it's okay to make a little stub, maybe stub things out if there's something you don't know about yet. Then come back and fill in the blanks later. Now, we, we might want to keep this stub. What we want is another class that looks like this, has the same method, but instead of returning dummy data, is actually going to do something. Uh, so what we want to do is we want the same method. Now, that's an easy thing to do, believe it or not. What I'm going to do in Eclipse is I can take out that method. I can extract this method, okay? And I can reuse this method in other places. What I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click, I'm going to choose Refactor, and I'm going to choose Extract Interface. What that will do is it's going to make a Java type that only has that method, and therefore it's going to make us easy to replicate this exact same method in another class. So for the interface, what I'll do is I'm going to name it something similar to uh, Plant DAO Stub. I'll call it I Plant DAO and I'm going to tell it I want to extract this method called fetch plants. Now I'll choose OK. And we'll give it a moment to think. And what we'll see is it's going to create this thing called an interface called iPlantDAO. The interface called iPlantDAO is going to have the Java doc that we've created previously, and it's also going to have just this method signature. Okay. Now, why do we do this? Well, let's take a look at plant DAO stub. Take a look. Notice that this class plant DAO stub now implements this interface called iPlantDAO. So the class plant DAO stub implements this interface iPlantDAO. Aside from that, plant DAO stub has not changed. Okay. Doesn't add much value yet, but watch this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on my source package and I'm going to say new and then I'm going to say class. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say plant DAO, or if I wish I could call it plant DAO impl, that would be fine. Let's call it plant DAO impl. Super class is fine, but watch this. I'm going to choose interface add, okay? And then I'm going to choose I plant DAO, which is that interface that we just made, and choose okay. Let's see, it's going to wire up right here. Uh, after that, I'm going to choose Finish. Now look at Plant DAO Impl, and notice what it does is very nicely, it puts in that same method 
that we used in plant DAO stub. Okay, puts in that same method signature, and it leaves it, it, leaves it to us now uh, to actually fill in the blanks on what we want to do there. So it's a way of loosely relating together two different classes. What value does that bring us? Let's go to plant results activity. And uh, what we'll see is that in that refactoring, it changed our variable type to the new interface we created, iPlantDAO. And again, what is iPlantDAO? It simply says that any class that's associated with this interface, any class that's associated, associated with this interface must have this method signature. Okay, who's associated with this interface? If I put my cursor on there, hold Control D, it's going to show me that the stub that we created earlier and the implementation are both associated with this interface I plant DAO. Now, here's what makes that really powerful. Let's look at plant results activity. You notice the variable type is that interface type. What makes that really powerful now is that if we want to take our plant results activity, if we want to take this screen, if we want to change from the stub to the implementation, all we have to do is change what we call this constructor call on the end. We'll have to do a quick uh, control shift O to organize imports. That's all we have to do. And we have now told our activity, in other words, our screen, to switch from the stub with just a dummy implementation that returns the same two classes all the time. Instead, we wanted to use the actual interface. So uh, that's why, I'm sorry, it's, we wanted to use the actual impl implementation. That's where an interface is nice, because with an interface, we can associate two classes like the stub or the impl, or as many classes as we want, to be honest with you. And then it's very easy to change which one we actually use in code. We change this one, we don't need to, ch need to change this line or any other line within this class. Only the one where we're saying, only the line where we're saying, this is the class that I want to use to do this unit of work. So that's an object-oriented concept, maybe, maybe a little uh, too detailed for what we're doing in this class, but that's a common object-oriented concept. Okay. So what do I want to do in the actual implementation? What I'm going to want to do is assemble a URI to facilitate the plant search. Okay, string URI. Don't know what that will be yet. We'll fill that blank in later. Okay, call this URI using the HTTP get method. Okay. Uh, don't know what that is yet. We'll fill that in later. Let me control M so we can maximize the screen. Okay, and then we're going to say get back the response and parse it as a JSON object. Okay, uh, so don't know what that is yet. We'll get to that. Now, we I'm going to go ahead and save. We stated earlier that with these HTTP methods, it's pretty much boilerplate. You're going to have string coming in, which is a URI, string going out, which is the data that we get from that URI. It's pretty much boilerplate. We're going to probably want to reuse this over and over again. And when we want to reuse something, we don't want to keep sticking it in the same method as we have here. Why is that mean? Why does that not like it? Okay, unreachable code. I need to take this out. We don't want to put it in the same method. Reusable stuff should go in its own method. Okay. Reusable stuff should go in its own method, uh, which will make it, which will uh, make it easier to reuse. Actually, I'll tell you what. Let me take this return null, put it towards the bottom here. That way, we'll just temporarily satisfy our red line. There we go. And Control D. Let me clean things up just a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save. I'm going to make one new, one more new class. Right click on com.plantplaces.dao. I'm going to choose new in class, and I'm going to make one called network DAO. Okay, and that's all we really need for that. Finish. Okay. Now, within this network DAO, I'm going to have a very simple method. It's going to accept a URI as a string and return the results from that URI. Guess what? As a string. Let's try it out. String. Uh, okay, so we'll make it a public method, 
returns a string, which are going to be the results. We'll name the method anything we want. I can call it request. That sounds like a good name. And it's going to accept a string. So you see here, uh, in the past, you might have wondered what all of this stuff means. Uh, public string request. And then string URI. So I'll say string result data equals boom boom. Return result data. Let's try and just get past uh, the red line issues we're having. Okay, you might have wondered what these things were in the past. We have a string, which is getting returned from this method. A string, which is telling us where to go. In other words, uh, when we make this request, this will be the incoming string, whatever our, whatever our request is. And the data here will be the outgoing string. So you see two strings there. String coming in is the URI. String going out is the data that we're getting from fetching that URI. Now this is all going to be a lot easier to follow if I start adding some comments. So let me uh, just add some comments here, some javadoc comments that say perform common network operations that should be shared across multiple classes. Okay. For the request, this is where the javadoc really comes in handy. Uh, access the given URI and return the data that it returns. Okay, URI, the universal resource identifier. In other words, a URL, where we want to go. Uh, return the data that we find when we go to that URI. Okay, and save. Okay, now what we need to do is glue together some of the things I talked about on this slide. An HTTP GET, Response Handler, and Default HTTP Client. Okay, so uh, let me go back. Okay, and we'll clean up this... Uh, We'll clean up the rest of the stuff in just a moment, this stuff down here. So uh, what we'll start with is HTTP GET, HTTP GET equals new HTTP GET. Don't worry too much about the minutia here. This is really just boilerplate stuff. Uh, if you want to do something like this, you're welcome to basically copy and paste the example that I'm putting together for you. Control Shift O will organize imports. Okay, so I'm going to say provide the URI to the HTTP get method so or class object. Let's say object so that it will fetch that URI. Really, all I can say about that. Okay. Now we're going to say assemble a handler that will know to return a string to us. We'll know two returns. Okay. And we're going to say response handler string response handler equals new basic response handler. Again, don't be too concerned about, oh wait, what's a basic response handler? What's a response handler? Don't worry too much about that. Just know that the four or five lines that I'm putting together here is really all you need to know to uh, go to a URL and get back the data that it returns. Okay. Marry together the HTTP GET with the response handler. Okay, so for that what we're going to need is an HTTP client. HTTP client equals new default HTTP client. Okay, and then get the data back. Okay, HTTP client dot execute. Okay, and then we're going to pass in the HTTP get. Whoops, went too far. And the response handler. Okay, uh, let me control shift O, organize imports. Okay. Now, one trick is this is going to require some exception handling. We don't know what exception handling means yet. So just control one and, and say uh, add throws declaration. We will talk about exception and then we'll change it to exception. 
we will talk about exception handling in a future lecture. So we'll come back and cover that. Okay, uh, and there we go. Okay, now this execute method is going to return a string. So I'll say assign to new local variable string, and we'll call it result. And that string is simply what we're going to return. So at this point, we can just return result. There we go. It's as easy as that. And then I save. So this is all you need. Let me put a comment above this. Return the data we fetched from that URI. This is really all we need to take a URL and get back data. Now we're simply going to need to invoke this method. That is the method in Network DAO. We're going to need to invoke that from our plant DAO impl. Okay, so let's start filling in the details of our plant DAO impl. And after that, what we're going to do is throw this in the debugger. And we're not going to parse it out yet. We're not going to know what JSON is just yet. But we will at least get to the point where uh, we can watch a request go in and watch it come back. Okay. So, what is the URI? Well, let's go back and actually the URI that we're going to use is this one. Plantplaces.com uh, slash Perl slash mobile viewplantsjsonpl. And then the thing that's going to change is the term on the end, which right now I have this one set up to be redbud. That's the thing that's going to vary based on what the user enters. So, let me copy everything except for that search term. I'm going to copy. I'm going to go back and string URI equals, and I'm going to paste. Note that it does include the HTTP, which is uh, not, we, we don't see that by default in our browser many times. Now, for that string on the end that varies, that's just the search term here. It's what the user has entered. Boom. Easy as that. Okay, now call this, so we have our URI now. Now call this URI using the HTTP get method. Okay, so first, I'm going to need to create a variable and object of the uh, network DAO class. Network DAO, network DAO. Okay, take a look at this. This is declaring a variable. We have the type first, which is the class that we just created, and then we have a variable name. Note the subtle difference. These are not the same name because the variable name is not capitalized where the type is capitalized. You don't want to have those to be identical. Uh, that's why we make this one lowercase. So declaring a variable is declaring a place in memory. Okay. Now I'm going to say to, uh, we're going to put the object on the right. To create an object, we say new network DAO. We have to have both of these, the variable and the object. The variable declared on the left, the object on the right. What happens is we create this object and we push it into the variable on the left. We create the object on the right, like so. We push it into the variable on the left, like so. And the equal sign is what makes that happen. Okay? So, declare variable, which declares a place in memory. Create object and put it in that memory actually puts something meaningful in that memory. Now, uh, let's say, make the... Um, We'll put this on the next line. We already have a comment there. Get back the response and parse it as a JSON object. Let's say network DAO dot request. Now take a look. Take a look. Network DAO dot request. I'm going to have to move this over just a little bit. Okay. This is off screen a little bit, but if you look over to the left, what you'll see is some text that looks a little bit familiar. And that's that javadoc text we put above the method. That's why these things are so nice. Because uh, with javadoc, if we're calling a method, we can get a glimpse of what that javadoc is in our editor without actually going to that method. So we can get a glimpse of what that method does by looking at the javadoc in Eclipse. And we don't actually have to go into that class and see what the javadoc is. It'll bring it up in a context-sensitive manner, as we just saw. So network DAO dot req and it is frozen at the moment. Okay. Okay, network DAO request. And we're going to send in our URI. And we know that's going to return a string. And we're interested in that string. 
So I am going to control one. Uh, okay, once again, we don't know what exceptions are. Um, in this case, I'm going to surround with try catch. So we will come back and discuss about that more later. Uh, okay, I'm going to control one and I'm going to assign to new local variable and we're going to say this is string result. What I'm going to do because I want to uh, I want to put a breakpoint here and I want to evaluate this line. I'm going to put just a dummy line below it int i equals one. That will give me a chance to execute that line, step to the next line, and then go back and look at the results. That dummy line is there just for a moment. I need to do just a couple more things. First of all, return null is going to give us trouble. Let me make a result. Okay, this is the result that we will return. Array list plant, all plants equals new array list plant. Okay, so that will be our return type. Uh, we're not going to populate it just yet. I just don't like returning null, all plants. Okay, control S. Number two, in order to do a network call, what we're going to need to do is request permission to do a network call. Okay, if you load an Android app, if you have an Android phone, or even if you upgrade, you'll see that it will take you through uh, a screen where it tells you what permissions, uh, what permissions that the um, application is asking for. And it looks like we already have this one set. We have to ask for permission. Internet looks like that one's already set for us. So we're not going to need to change it. Uh, if we did, I could just go to the permissions tab in Android Manifest, choose Add, and then choose Uses Permission. But we've already set that up in a previous exercise, so we're good. Okay. What we want to do now then, we're not expecting any results because we know we still have to do something with the data that we get in return. Uh, but what we want to do now, I'm going to enable breakpoint, we simply want to watch this DAO impl run. We want to watch it request this URI. And we want to watch it, uh, we want to see what data it gets back from that URI. We also want to watch this boilerplate stuff execute. So I'm going to set a series of breakpoints, and then we're going to debug, and let's watch what happens. Debug is an Android application, and let's keep an eye on what happens. I've loaded the app, and now we're going to have to. Now we're going to want to search. What's interesting is that we're actually going to have to search with a real term now. Before I just put in garbage data, but now we're actually hitting live data. So I'm going to type in Maple, and then I'm going to choose search. And uh, it will come over and the breakpoint should hit in Eclipse, which is what we're hoping to see. And we'll give this a moment to catch up. Okay, uh, this is simply our results activity. I'm going to step over it one item at a time. And I'm going to confirm that the search term is indeed maple. It is. Okay, now if I do the math here, uh, what we should see is it should assemble a URL that looks like this, maple, like that. And we should see search results that look like this, which is quite a few, to be honest with you. Lots of maples. So we're now going to fire up the plant search task, which is the thread, which is going to run this network operation. That's important. When you're doing network operations, you have to use, number one, make sure you're requesting internet permission. And number two, you must do it in a separate thread using the, uh, for example, the async task in, uh, in Android 4 and greater. In 2.2, you could get away without threading, but it tended to cause apps to lock up just because people would keep hitting a button while you were doing a long network operation. It would appear that the app was frozen when it was actually doing a network operation. But uh, nonetheless, in 4.0, you must do network operations in a separate thread. You should really do it in a separate thread uh, for any version. But the good news is we've already set that up. We have our plant search task here. We set that up in a previous lecture. I'm going to go ahead and play. And the next breakpoint that should hit, okay, is that separate thread. And we see what it's going to do now is I'm going to step over one line at a time. It's going to initialize our variable and it's going to declare our variable. 
of the interface type and it's going to assign it this time to the impl, to the actual implementation. Not the stub like we had before, but the actual implementation. Okay, I'll go ahead and step over that. And the next line will be where we step into this implementation. Remember, right now, if you look here, we're on the plant results activity. So we're going to step into this method. Okay, and we're going to assemble a URL. Okay, let's take a look at what the URL is. I'll mouse over. It has the full URL here. I can copy. Let's see what happens when I just put this into a browser. Okay, copy. Go to a browser window. It should look exactly like this, to be honest with you. I'm going to choose a new browser tab, and I'm going to paste. And again, this should be what we've been seeing already. Um, I'll give it a moment to think here. And there we go. So it's going to return to us some data uh, about maples. Okay. Um, okay. So we're going to create our network DAO. And we're going to tell our network DAO to request this URI. Uh, I'm going to choose a step into here. Now this is going to go through those boilerplate lines that I said, you know, don't worry too much about the minutia. Uh, just take a look at what it's doing, it's taking a URI, it's returning to us result. Now, line 37, we might see a brief pause here because this is where it's actually going to do that request. So my fingers are crossed. This is where it's going over the network. Sure enough, we see a little pause. When it comes back, this variable called result, take a look at what we have. Uh, this might be a little bit difficult to see in our um, screencast-o-matic in the YouTube video, but take a look at what we have here. You see all this? Okay, let me copy this. I'm going to control A, control C, and I'm going to open it in uh, Notepad. One second as I, as I raise Notepad. And what we're going to see is that sure enough, the data here is our maple data, isn't it? And that looks exactly like what we got on the website. Okay, that looks exactly like our web search results. So we have successfully made a connection to the web. Now all we need to do is parse out that data. That's easy to do because this is already in JSON format. Uh, so uh, that's a pretty easy thing for us to do. So that, uh, the purpose of this lecture was just to explore how we can create our network connection. I'm going to go ahead and let this play through. Explore how we can do that network connection. And then it was uh, to take a look at refactoring an interface out of an existing class. And then it was looking at how we can pass in a URI and get data back. So we've successfully done everything we've wanted to do for this lecture. What we'll do is we'll stop this lecture now. In our next lecture, we're going to take a look at how to parse this data now that we have it and how to turn it into a JSON object. You'll see right now we're not actually getting any results because we're not parsing that data. Parsing the data is actually quite straightforward. Uh, it's a pretty easy thing to do. But uh, just quick recap of what we've done. We created this class called Network DAO. This is an all-purpose class that will uh, we can reuse in other applications and in other network calls. It simply takes a URI, fetches data from that URI using the get method, returns a result. We created a plant DAO impl. Okay. Before we did that, though, we took our stub and we wanted to make a class that looks like this, but instead of always returning the same data, we actually wanted to fetch data across the network. So to do that, we extracted an interface out of this class. The interface gave us that same method that we have here. Interface gave us that same method. We were able to extract that out. Okay. And then we were able to create a class that also implements this interface. And by also implementing that interface, it's under contract to have that very same method. The difference is in this method, we're actually getting live data and live results. Okay. Then what we did is we switched our results activity to use this class with the live data. Okay, we'll just show where we wired that up. 
use the class with the live data instead of the stub that just had dummy data. So we did quite a bit in this lecture. Uh, next lecture will just show us how to parse that data out, and then we're going to be in good shape for our next programming assignment. Thank you once again for your attention, and please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or feedback. Thank you.